early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. And now to our second big story for today, which is to look at the projection and the report by the International Monetary Fund. Interestingly, IMF is celebrating its 80th anniversary this year, and the international body has seized the opportunity to release a report as regards the performance of the global economy. You're aware of what happened to the global economy when we had COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, since then, uh, the the global economy has been going through turbulent times has to do with high inflation issue of high debt and all sorts but in spite of these challenges imf report is stating that the uh, global economy has maintained some level of resilience and is that a reason to celebrate or to say that uh, the global economy is out of the woods imf however is also sending a note of alert and caution to ensure that nations need to exhibit more re resilience to ensure that the economic recovery that has been experienced in the last few years has been sustained. Joining us for this conversation, we have Dr. Osase Osase Iyo, who joins us as an economic analyst, and he joins us all the way from Canada. Glad to have you join us this morning, Dr. Zazi, and good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, good morning. How is Canada today? Yeah, Canada is fine. We are here. We are fine, thank you. It's, it's obvious and written all over you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's that's just on a light note. But let's look at the yeah. um, the report by the IMF as to gas global economy. One significant thing that IMF, IMF has pointed out is the resilience of the global economy in spite of the challenges. You're aware that um, in the last few years and since COVID-19 pandemic, uh, economies around the world have been battling with the issue of high inflation, tightening of the issue of monetary policy, uh, the issue of debt here and there. But as stated by this report, the level of resilience has also been something to look at. What are the factors, do you think, what are these factors driving this resilience as stated by IMF globally? Um, I could barely hear you. I hope you can hear me, Dr. Osazi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. So I hope okay. you heard my question. Um, talking about... I heard it. I heard it very Okay. Clear. Let me rephrase the question. My question is for you to give us a picture of some of the factors, you know, driving this resilience stated by IMF. You're aware of the challenges that nations have been battling with. Uh, since uh, we had COVID-19 and the post-COVID has posted some challenges that has to do with disruption of supply chain, the issue of food and energy crisis. But in spite of these challenges, IMF is saying that the global economy has maintained some level of resilience. What are the factors driving this? And what's your take on this report? Yeah, I, I, I briefly, I was able to... Um, read the report. I saw a brief of the report quite briefly. Um, resilience, for the sake of our listeners, resilience we would want to define in economics as very simply um, an ability to respond to shock quickly. That's a, a sort of neutralization, um, reduction in the shock level that an economy would respond to when there's an external um, event, just like we had with um, COVID. So a resilient economy would not shrink or would not go into negative, very negative growth when a COVID, for example, hits. So resilience is just an ability to, um, to handle shock better and an ability to, to bounce back from a downturn. So... When um, IMF says the world, the global economy is a bit more resilient now, um, I don't know if to agree or to disagree, but um, I want to say that that report is um, it's undulated. It's not comp it's not comprehensive for 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 want of a better word, 
that it's it probably just taking an average of the global economy. And I think I saw it in parts in the report, though not it was not expressly stated, but in parts. Um, the fact that, yes, yeah, most countries have, or rather some countries have been able to bounce back of um, COVID, of the shock, economic shock that COVID um, bestowed on us. So post-COVID, most countries, especially the developing economies, have met their central bank inflation target. Yes, yeah, so most kind of like Canada is about 2.33, US is about 2.5, 2.8, and UK is, is even lower, about 2.1. Japan, it's it's even struggling to not go into a deflation because it's almost 1.9, less than 2. And generally, globally, CBNs like to peg their ideal inflation rate at anything between 2, 2.5 maximum three so the most developing the most developed economies have gone around at least they're hang, hovering around this um target but why i said the report is not comprehensive is that the emerging economies and the developing economies are still very very far off this target we, we have countries like nigeria that are still in their, their mid-30s we have countries like Ghana stay around yet yeah, 30, 40s, and we have you know Venezuela, Argentina. So um I don't know how really true the resilience is because there's still there's still so much the, the, the global economy is still battling since post-COVID. There have been series of wars, there have been series of you know post um um, um Ukraine Russia war came up. Um, later on, the, the Middle East and its various crises have come up, and pockets of war even in in Africa. So, but if if I have to talk about what has probably yielded this resilience for developed economies, it's simple. They've they've just gone to use monetary tightening, and for regulated economies or formal economies that I want to say, economies that are regulated, we are monetary. Where there is a large, the larger sec part of the economy is formal. The formal sector is 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 wider. Or like in Nigeria, we have almost like a 60, 40, 60 informal, 40 or formal. But in developed economies where they have about 90% of the economy formal. So monetary tightening works. And, and, and that's what has brought um the resilience in developed economies. So you had immediately after post-COVID, you had um UK, US, Germany, Canada, name all the, the, the developed economies, they started increasing rates. And they have continued doing it from the Canada just for the first time reduced rates last month. Um UK um US is mulling doing that and, and so on. So it has been monetary tightening and of course, you know, when you increase it, it what it does is that it reduces aggregate demand so that there's less money, so to speak, in the economy, just like the basic inflation and definition, less money per share few goods. So it just increases rates so that um borrowers, businessmen, you reduce their ability to 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 to, to get access to funds. So it reduces um, monies in the hands of people because the whole idea about inflation is that there's too much, everybody is chasing, people have so much money and the goods to satisfy that demand is not enough. So they want to moderate, the idea is to moderate demand so that it comes to the level of supply and there's a match because when there's when the, when the supply is inadequate to meet the demand, then scarcity comes and prices increase. So it has been monetary tightening, basically, the resilience. Developed economies have increased rates, so it has reduced aggregate demand. It has led to more savings, because even savers would, when you increase rates, you have your fixed um, exchange, your fixed term um, securities, like your treasury bills and so on, become high and become attractive for people to want to buy so if you were getting two percent on your interest on your treasury bills or treasury certificates before when rates are increased you, you, are, you are getting the government is telling you that you can get seven percent on 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 bonds on treasury bills so of course you forgo 
your consumption and 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 buy those um instruments so increasing interest rate increases savings reduces aggregate demand so the aggregate demand now comes to the level of supply then prices now at an equilibrium so it's been increased interest rate for developed economy but for developing economies i don't know how i don't know how resilient how, how much we can say we are resilient nigeria for example how resilient are we are we saying if there's a shock today in oil prices oil prices are falling are, are constantly as, as has dropped yeah at least below our ben our budget benchmark was on um 77 dollars Oil has been selling be, be between 68 70 in the couple of weeks and you see it, it, it has you see the effect on our exchange rates and and, and i'm sure in the next few few months i can show you you hear government now saying oh they are struggling to pay salaries there because oil prices have been so i don't know how much for developing economies i would want not i, I won't want to agree with that report but i think they have just taken an average and said on the average the developed economies have shown resilience and um, done an average on it yeah right all right it it's it's important to know that um, even though IMF has acknowledged that there is global soft landing uh, in this report as well, the IMF has also acknowledged that um, there's disparity or divergence when it comes to the issue of growth and inflation among countries and nations. So in fairness to IMF, so it's also there. So given that kind of report, there's a balance to it, there's fairness to it to paint the two sides. And now let's address the issue of inflation, which has been something crucial since um, or post-pandemic. You observe that the developed economies, you know, like what the report has stated, the central banks in these economies, they are eating their target. When it comes to inflation, you have UK, you have Canada, you have US, who, whose uh, inflation rate is between two point between 2% and 2.5%. Now, for the emerging economies and developing economies, like you said, the reverse is the case. Now, let's address this disparity between these two entities. What do you think is the missing link here? If globally, the idea is to see how to tighten up the economy to manage inflation and the Developing economies are eating their target. You know, you have the U.S. eating the target of, even though the target is 2%, oh, yeah, but it, uh, the U.S., you know, is between, as if the target of 2.5%. Now, we know the situation, the economic situation in the U.S. is different from that of Africa and some other countries, but let's see what they are doing differently. Uh, if post-pandemic, they are eating their target, why do you think of uh, the developing nations or the emerging markets are not eating their target. And what lesson can they learn from this as confirmed by this report that there's divergence when it comes to the issue of growth and inflation? Yeah, yeah, clearly. Uh, I would want to adduce it to three factors. Why um, in developing economies have not been able to match the success of the developed economies. Three factors. One would be the fact that I mentioned earlier on, um, the, the, the disparity or the discrepancy between or the disproportionality between the formal sector and the informal sector in these developing economies, that has been, that's, that's very key. And also the fact that um, production, we had, these developing countries had pre-pandemic issues, which have not vanished overnight. The fact that we are consumption, most of these developing economies are a consumption economy. We are not producers. You, you, you can't compare Nigeria, for example, to a Germany. A, a Germany where you have a, you have a you have a BMW, you have a Volkswagen, you have Mercedes Benz, you have Audi, you have Siemens, you have you have very, very large, these are these are world class companies. So in, in, in economies like that, production is at the highest level you can't you can't so so let, let me quickly touch on the disp disproportionality as, as i said between the formal and informal sector and i think that's key the fact that you see that developed economies have been increasing rates the same way um developing economies did immediately after uh, the pandemic 
both both all countries of the world started increasing rates. Nigeria started immediately too. But what has been the success story? Nigeria has been increasing rates and inflation has been running away. Meanwhile, the developing economies were increasing rates and um, inflation was tampering down. Why? It's simple. Because of the formal... See, monetary policy generally is usually targeted at the formal sector. It, it, there's really no... There's really no two ways about it. it. Cannot there's no magic that can be performed, and that's why it's a policy mix that I suggest that. And we'll get to the suggestions, but very briefly, because I'll use an example to drive home this point, so that we we don't use too much theory. Go to a, a, a market like Alaba, for example. I think I've used that example before, or Idumota, those big large electronics market. I'm sure we can count how many of those shops are registered with CAC. How many of those shops, there should be over a thousand shops in those markets I called, but I'm not sure we'll be able to count about 50 or 100 who are registered with CAC, who have tax clearance with FRS, who have audited reports, who are registered with PENCOM. Who, you know, these are, these are criteria for a formal organization. And when you want to lend money, borrow money from the bank, these are documents that you present. To get money from the bank as an as a as a businessman, you need to be you need to go with your tax clearance, three years tax clearance, audited report, CAC. How many of these um, um markets, how many of these shops have those um CAC clearance? Or go to Kano, one of the largest markets in West Africa. How many shops will you say are CAC? So, so you see that the informal sector is very wide. So when you keep increasing interest rates, the idea of increasing interest rates is that you want to reduce money in supply, in circulation. You want to make it difficult for producers or businessmen to be able to get the same funds that they were getting before you increase interest rates. You want to reduce it so that they are not able to get such and they are not able to spend more into the economy. You want to temper the aggregate demand but, but but when you are not when when these sectors these companies these shops these medium small medium scale um, and enterprises that you are trying to target they are not within the monetary scope they are outside it they don't even rely on the banks how many of these businessmen in Kano when you want to go to the banks they don't they go to the informal sector they go to some cooperatives they go to some very low microfinance banks that are not within the monetary sector, go to um, cooperative OIDA and so on. You see most of these people in these um, big markets, they do contribution. So you see that the informal sector is very, very large. So we increase interest rates and it's just bouncing back. It's not having any in impact. Unlike in developed countries like the US, the Canada and so on, you cannot, if I, you, you dare not, you, you, you can't, it, it doesn't come to your mind. You can't even think it. Before you think of it, you have to perish it. So you can't set up a business, no matter how small the shop is, without having those documents that make you formal, which you can do. In fact, there's no other place you get funds other than, other than the bank. It's, it's a centralized system. So any increase in rates or any of the monetary tools goes directly and has direct impact. And immediately it reduces aggregate demand. So that's why um, monetary policy was successful in those areas and it has brought down, um, brought down inflation, but it hasn't had the same effect in developing uh, economies. And uh, the, the second point, point I touched on was on production. Most of these developing, developed economies, what the, the only issue that pa the pandemic had on them was that they were not able to sell their, their, their product. Country, countries like China, that is a very large um, producing economy. During pandemic, they had to close the factories. So immediately as the pandemic was over, they just went business as usual, started producing cars, started producing chips, and gradually exports came in, forex. So it, it, everything just started to normalize. They just had to take time for it to normalize. So funds started coming in. But the developing economies, what, what we just now did where we now started consuming more. We are, we, we are generally not producers. Nigeria produces nothing, except for even the oil where we, we produce probably it's, it's, it's stolen. Probably very 60, 70% is stolen. 
most of our agricultural produce have been banned in most European countries, yam, beans, and so on. So what's our production? So we only started consuming more, started importing from China, importing and so So it only affected our trade deficit, affected our bill balance of payment, our forest deficit widened. So you see that there are two opposites. So those are some of the discrepancies that we have had. So talking about solution quickly, I think, first of all, let's bring We've said this a million times. The formal sector should be expanded. Government should bring in policies that bring most of this large informal sector back into the formal sector. But I'm afraid that we are not doing that. After the last, um, um, what do you call it, Naira redesign that was done, it even further widened the informal sector because people learned their lesson. People said they will have nothing to do with the bank because their money was trapped in in the bank because we played politics with it and um, we are increasing rates increasing um, um technology and um, fee and some bringing some ridiculous fees into the bank so we are we are, we are unfortunately even widening the um the 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 the, the informal sector um yes indirectly and also production we've said it a million times you cannot you cannot you cannot grow as a nation if you don't produce there's no there are really no two ways about it you can bring out all the policies. And that's why I said it's a policy mix. Monetary policy, as from my first explanation, is not going to work. Monetary policy has done the best it can in Nigeria. We should stop. I think the whole discussion about central bank, it's, it's we are belaboring. Central bank has done the best they can do. There's really nothing. I think they've exhausted all that is in the theory, all that is in the books. They've increased interest to it. They've increased CRO, um, RO. They've increased the asymmetric corridor window. And it remains the way it is. It, 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 Nigeria's problems are structural. So there has to be, and I think I saw it in the IMF report, there has to be good policy blend. The monetary policy has gets, got into its limit. Fiscal policy, is, I'm afraid, is doing nothing. You, you know, the banditry has led to um, 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 food inflation. What have we done concerning security? Probably nothing. Um, customs, delays, um, importation. Of, you, you have businessmen who tell you that for one month, their goods are at customs, uncleared. You go to countries like Ghana, 24 hours, your goods are cleared. But in Nigeria, it takes one week, two weeks. What has been done about it? Nothing. The roads are bad. What has been done about it? Nothing. Power, that is the major reason why. Um, um, ShopRite left Nigeria about a couple of years ago. Uh, we know series of country companies are leaving the country. And ask almost all of them is because of power. DSTV recently said last time that they are spending about 2.8 billion or so on electricity only. So that's been the major reason why we have not been able to produce. So power, what has been done about it? Is that monetary policy? No, that's fiscal policy. The roads, insecurity, customs, these are fiscal policy issues that has to be fixed by government. So until we do that, if monetary policy would do nothing. It will only be, we've said it so many times, in an, in, in an attempt to address inflation by increasing rates, what you are doing is that you are hurting economic growth. The more you keep increasing rates, the more you keep damaging, you, you keep reducing the chances of growth. And that's why our growth has been, because there's really no two way about growth is investment in the economy, production increases, um, people are employed, salaries get into people. But by the time you keep starving producers of funds by continuously increasing interest rate, it means they are not able to invest in the economy. And what's growth? Growth is an aggregate of productivity, how much, how much goods and services is produced in the economy. So when you deprive starve producers of funds, then your growth reduces. So CBN has to, at some point, stop this rate increase. And I was surprised at the last rate increase that it did. It was, it was needless because you've been doing it for the last 18 months. It started in the last 18 right. months. And All right. Uh, so if, if you allow me, uh, let me let me come in here. Talking about the issue of increase and all that, there's something uh, the IMF stated earlier. And I would like to quote the IMF so that you can react to, because you're almost heading there. I want. I, I would like you to just take a listen. What IMF, the forecast as regards this, the IMF is saying that um, fully restoring price stability is not yet. I, I would like you to listen to that. It's not yet guaranteed. Now, central banks will need to carefully balance the risk of premature easing against the... Um, 
against against that of delaying too long talking about the increase now there's a need for central banks all over the world to strike a balance here. that's what imf is saying i'll take that to glean you say central banks will need to carefully balance the risk of premature easing against that of delaying too long now here is the picture you have central banks across the world you know reducing rates uh, most of the developed economies reducing rates why that of developing or emerging markets they are increasing rates now the imf is sounding a warning that there's a need to strike a balance to know when to ease and then the implication of staying too long by not even increasing so how do you think developing nations importantly or most importantly can strike a balance here you just talked about nigeria where the CBN recently just decided to increase the benchmark interest rate as different from what other clients are doing based on the results that they are getting. Now, how do you strike a balance here between when to ease and not to stay too long in the course of benchmarking interest rate as stated by this report? Yeah, I, I think the developed countries have done have have been smart about it and that's why they are easing i, I think they've heard and what imf has said because if you see the reduction it has been by very small percentages um the the last rate reduction that canada did was just about uh 25 25 basis points yes that that, that was low um so it, it, they have they have done that it has been gradual easing you know, and and they couldn't stay too long, and that's the danger. Just like you pointed out, the danger of staying too long on increasing rates is that you are hurting economic growth. Yeah, because as as I earlier mentioned, growth is economic growth is defined as an aggregate of productivity, an aggregate of how much goods and services is being produced in the economy, and how the the producers need funds. There's hardly any producer, even the richest of them or Dan Gauthier and so on, who doesn't borrow. So how do you inject goods? Is by allowing producers to get enough access to funds. And how does that happen? By reducing the rates at which they are going to borrow. So if you reduce rates, they can borrow and they can invest into the economy, expand production, open more factories, employ more people, people get more income, then they can spend more. So income increases prosperity increases also because when you reduce rates, it means producers are going to close down some, some of their factories. It's going to lead to high unemployment, just like how you had in the US. You have Trump and the Demo um, Republicans using that as their campaign tool. So because of the several inc increase in rates, unemployment increased, factories closed down or reduced um, 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 production. So so that's why the balancing has to come in there. So, like area like like in Canada, for example, you had house how how uh, mortgage um, increasing. So house house rents or oh, yeah yeah. So your house rents or bills increased too. You had rooms that was about three fifty five hundred dollars some a couple of years ago, going for seven fifty one thousand dollars. And it's the same thing in UK. The housing crisis was much. Energy crisis was much. So. It, it had to. They had to start reducing rates since the inflation figures had been had, had the target has been reached two between two point two to two point five. So why continuously increasing rates? So they, they they did the right thing. You cannot sacrifice goods too much for inflation. Continuous with the increasing rates would further hamper growth. So there has to be a reversal at some point. But for the developing economies. They are they are a bit skeptic because they, they haven't seen any difference in inflation figures. They, they've done a review and there's no difference. And as I said, it's because there's the policy mix is not there. The fiscal policy most times seems to be dragging everything backwards. You have oil theft going on in Nigeria. You have um, gold theft going on. We are not even talking about that. Oil has gradually reduced. And I see oil... Um, prices continue to reduce because the U.S. election will take place in November. We know that politics come into this. You have Democrats who will try to put pressure on OPEC to continue to lift the price or even reduce the prices so that um, prices of fuel of, of um, yeah energy would, would would reduce in America because that will be their campaign we, we, uh, um, tool 
by the time prices of um, PMS goes to four, it's about three dollar there about now because crude oil prices are reduced. So I don't see it increasing, and it means that we it's going to continuously affect and uh, developing economy. So oil theft ha has been there. Um, um, you have issues with so fiscal issues, structural issues, insecurity, and so on. I, I lost my points, my my thoughts somewhere. So these issues are fiscal. So until we have this fiscal and um, monetary policy blend mix, CBN will continue to increase and there will still be no solution. So I sympathize with the uh, CBN in developing economies. They are trying to be theoretical. They don't see a difference in inflation rates as the developed economies have seen. So in their own mind, they think continuously increasing it will do. But I, I, I think at some point they have to temper it down and I don't know. I don't know who will call the fiscal authorities, which is our government, to now become more more responsible. I think there should be there should be um, there should be more accountability. Yeah, I'll, I'll, the point I was trying to make: oil prices. I was saying that oil prices will continuously get low, at least until after U.S. presidential election. So, for a country like Nigeria, this is where we should have fallen on gold. Gold is selling very, very. In fact, it's it's, it's selling more than um, um, oil at this point. We had gold in some far. We've had reports of some figures exporting gold in in, um, in in private jets to Saudi Arabia, to UAE, and so on. So these are the this is the time when we should have fallen back to gold. But gold is being stolen. We, we I, I I I don't know what the forex is, comes from there. Oil. We've been told that so much of our oil has been used for forward um, contracts with an um, African bank even with the Buhari administration, 10-year contract, 20-year contract. So it's just only about 20% of OF proceeds that even comes to the economy. Most have been used at Ford um, um, contract. The $3 right. billion dollar we got to last uh, time. Was sorry to bot in, but yeah. permit me to come in here. We'll, we'll still continue this conversation, but I'm told we need to go on a break now. Uh, this will be an opportunity for us to take the sound bite from the managing director of IMF as against the resilience, you know, let's take this sound bite. And while we go on break, I would love you to just take a listen. Then when we return, you react to the highlights of this. All right. We're going to okay. short break now. Uh, this will be an opportunity for us to take this sound bite. When we return, we'll continue our conversation with our guest. Stay with us. There are uncertainty in the year ahead. <laughs> The long period of low interest rates has led to a build-up of potentially, potentially serious financial sector vulnerability. And we are seeing a troubling increase in debt across many countries, and we need to remain watchful. We're trying to take a standby from uh, the arrowhead of the European Central Bank, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we couldn't just get it right. But the point is... One of the things uh, she talked about is the fact that, apart from the issue of inflation, as to the, she also talked about the issue of debt, you know, high debt profile that nations are battling with, with, which has largely eroded the financial buffer of some of these nations, even post-pandemic. Uh, now, for nations to build the right buffer as regards to keeping this resilience by this report, what are the necessary steps you think should be taken, most importantly for African nations who are still battling with high inflation and even the issue of food and energy crisis also severe here? So let's talk about the issue of um, IDA profile, which most of these nations are battling with. What would you expect them to do at this time for them to build the right buffer and resilience needed to keep up this momentum? Yeah, yeah, it's very simple. Two, there are two, two solutions. One, fiscal responsibility, less of corruption, more tightening loopholes in issues like oil theft, issues like gold theft, um, increased cost of governance. Yeah, fiscal discipline. It, it will definitely bring down um our 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 burgeoning debt then production it 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 there's really no two way about it you can't you can't be you can't be a developed economy 
if you are not producing and and not just production i've said it so many times secondary production and that's why in the last election the three candidates who campaigned i had a problem with all of them because they were all campaigning with agriculture agriculture with with the world has long passed agriculture secondary production i've said it so many times there there is no country that you count as developed now look at the g20 economies the g22 there's none of them that are not there is not a secondary producer there is a primary producer see saudi arabia despite all its oil is the largest oil producer in the world and very very responsible at that is responsible with its oil production it's not there's not so much theft at least as much as we know and yet you don't see them in the g20 economies it's for a reason it's because oil is primary product it's a primary product I, I've, I've said it so many times also look at a unit of Hilux, a Hilux vehicle, will sell for about 50, 60 million, 40 to 60 million on average. How many, how much will a barrel of oil sell? $70. So you mean it, it means you need to sell thousands of barrels of dollars of barrels of oil to be able to exchange for a unit of Hilux. And these countries who produce these Hilux produce these Hilux in thousands. So a country like Germany that is producing BMW, one unit, probably 20 million or 40 million, or a Prado Jeep, 160 million. Imagine producing thousands of those vehicles. So you see the you see the economies of scale, you see the um, you see the exchange compared the terms of trade. So the terms of trade of secondary products and terms of trade of primary products cannot be comparable. So it's so it's simple as I said, African countries, fiscal responsibility and production. We should it, it, there's really no there's no economy, none of the developing economies will give you dollars, no matter how genuine they are, no matter how much they love you, even IMF would not give you. Most time they give you and they are giving you very, very high conditions. So it's only when you produce that you get forex. And when you get forex, you show up your external reserves. When your external reserves is showed up, definitely your exchange rate comes down. When you get forex, the reason why we are having forex issues is because we are solely dependent on CBN. Anybody needs forex in Nigeria now, it's CBN. Dangote needs forex, CBN. The importance of toothpick, CBN. So they are overboarding. But imagine in a country where we had Siemens, we had Volkswagen, we had AM. Audi, we had BMW, we had Pojo in Nigeria. I wouldn't go to CBN when I need Forex. I will just go to Pojo. Those, they, they've sold cars to, to Ghana, to different countries. They have so much Forex in their account. They want to even dispose of it. So I go to Pojo, I go to BMW. I give them Naira. They give me dollar because they need Naira to also pay their staff. They need Naira to, to buy, to, to take care of some local. So they need it. So there is less pressure on CBN. So what happens is that Exchange rate will definitely come down because it's it, because there's a disparity. There's too much supply against lower. Um, there's too much demand against the lower um, de, um, supply of forex. That's why the price of forex, the price of uh, forex, is increasing. So production. It, 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 th those are the two ways about it. Production one. Then um, I've, I've I've missed my line of thought, but. Just like I mentioned, as I mentioned before, those are the two ways that we can um, that African countries can solve their their issues, especially when it comes to um, resilience, as the um, um, IMF um, MD talked about. Yeah. All right. Now the there's a warning from Lagarde here as regards uh, the vulnerability that may happen to most nations and uh, it, um, it, they are not out of words yet, which is why it's important to have what you call fiscal discipline, as you've said. But now let's talk about yeah. the issue of energy and food crisis. It's a global thing, yeah. you know, the disruption in the global supply chains, you know, which as a result of the war between Ukraine and Russia and the crisis in the Middle East and all of that. Now, for nations to be able to build buffers regards this, which was the second point I wanted you to address, you know, what will be the way out for African nations who are also likely affected by this disruption? And now that IMF is predicting or warning that um, as uncertainty may arise, there's a need for nations to sit up. 
what are your expectations as you get tackling the issue of energy and food crisis? You know, some nations, especially the advanced ones, they floated what you call subsidy regime, you know, to manage this. Do you see that happening in Africa? <coughs> Does that sound like a strange word? Yeah, I'll quickly give an example to, to show. I, I know subsidies, IMF has seemed to to um, give subsidy a, a bad name, like a dog with a bad name. So they've advised African countries to cut down subsidies before, and that's because we've gone hand in cap, in cap in hand to the, the, the beggar. When you go to meet your 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 um, your benefactor to beg for money, you have no choice. So they've told us cut down on the subsidy because, according to them, I've blamed IMF most times for giving those wrong advice. But at some point, from the economic side of view, you see that it's not really wickedness. They want to give you money. They are advancing credits to you. And they don't want, and they've seen that there's corruption in the subsidy system. I'm sure in their heart of hearts, they know subsidy is not a bad thing. There's no country in the world, I've said it in, in the East, in the West rather, that does not subsidize something. There's no country <clears throat> that does not subsidize anything. So making it look like subsidy is a bad thing, it, 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 that's why I have a problem. But the fact is that they see that there's so much corruption in the subsidy system. So they've advised most countries to, uh, African countries, before they advance it, and that's why Nigeria has been cutting down subsidies on everything because they want to be able to draw down on borrowings from IMF. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing developments.